Good evening. Can you hear me? We do have a number of latecomers. I understand the traffic has been difficult, but we need to begin because we have a lot to do this evening and a big program. I am Janice Monty. I am the director of the Blues and the Spirit Symposium. I am also Chair of Sociology and Criminology at Dominican University. That is my day job. Uh, let me begin by thanking the administration of Dominican University for its continuing support of what has become one of the only national conferences on the blues legacy. Let me also acknowledge the support provided this year by a new community partner, U.S. Bank, for their, for their generous support of this opening session. And we're also grateful for the continuing partnership with Living Blues Magazine from the very beginning. This gathering has brought together participants from all over the U.S., from Maine to California, and points in between. Uh, among our guests tonight are some old friends who have attended every one of these symposia back to 2008, as well as a few special guests. Some of them are not quite here yet, but I do want to acknowledge them. Uh, members of Chicago's blues heritage families, as I like to call them. Of course, the Kester and the Scott families who are going to be honored tonight. <laughs> Betty White, the widow of Artie Blues Boy White, is coming in. Uh, uh, Larry Mud Morganfield is here, the son of the iconic Muddy Waters. the face of your father. <laughs> uh, Anna Codre, wife of the noted soul artist Bill Codre. Jimmy Mays is coming in, the esteemed drummer known as the sideman to the stars. And we are waiting on one of our godmothers, Joyce Cookie Taylor Threat, daughter of our queen of the blues, Coco Taylor. We are extraordinarily grateful to this blues community for the support over the years. Now we have a very interesting and eclectic program planned for you this evening and tomorrow. Oh, and oh dear, one more. Excuse Eddie C. Campbell has, has joined us as well, my dear. And we are, we are so glad to see Eddie up and about with us, okay? So, um, we've got an interesting program tonight and tomorrow, all accentuated by two nights of fabulous music by some of the best artists performing in, in not just in Chicago, but in the world today. So we're gonna begin Blues in the Spirit by evoking the spirit. The invocation, because this is a Dominican-sponsored Roman Catholic institution, will be delivered this evening by one of Dominican's most accomplished student leaders of the class of 2014, Miss Megan Graves. Megan graduated early this month with a double major in Black World Studies and Pastoral Ministry and a minor in Theology. Megan. Good evening, everyone. It's such an honor and a blessing to be with so many wonderful scholars today. Thank you. Um, if I may so ask if you all would mind bowing your heads and um, being aware of each other's presence this evening. Most gracious and loving God, bless us as we gather in this beautiful and sacred space, Dominican University, this evening and tomorrow for the fourth Blues and the Spirit Symposium. Unite us as we come together, musicians, scholars, students, and friends of the music, to celebrate, discuss, and be in relationship with the legacy of black music and the evolving blues aesthetic. 
Allow us to honor those who created the blues and to give respect to those who keep the spirit vibrant and alive. Provide us with the wisdom to praise, bless, and preach this tradition as a heritage of beauty and struggle. Ignite us in a sense of appreciation and consciousness for those who have gone before us within this tradition of music that has evolved through the real human experience. Bless all of us here today as we celebrate the vastness of creativity through music in the name of caritas and veritas, truth and love. Amen. <clears throat> The Blues and the Spirit Symposium, fr from its inception, has juxtaposed a wide range of scholarly perspectives alongside the testimony of lived experience of the blues folk, of those who live and work in the tradition, and so many of you are here with us. It's an eclectic gathering, and the ensuing conversation has often been very provocative. This year's theme of blues impurities embraces the music's cultural heritage as well as contemporary expressions of the blues aesthetic that transcend narrow boundaries and rigid definitions. So it's going to build on the discussions generated in previous years. Now the deliberate focus on race and gender in, in the blues in the last symposium resulted in some very heated back and forths between various stakeholders at the 2012 symposium. And it has continued over the past two years on social media and elsewhere. Several prominent national blues artists at the last symposium shared stories about racism in the business and the decline of opportunities for black artists. These trends, I am sorry to say, have unfortunately continued, as we see from some of the data that has been gathered for us by the Blues Coalition. You might want to check out those posters sometime in the next couple of days. Some of the musicians who testified about their experiences were called out publicly, sadly, almost as if they had violated a taboo by speaking honestly. The remarks by these artists and their allies throughout the last symposium elicited a strong pushback and charges of reverse racism by some of those in attendance, and also by critics who weren't even here. Some were chagrined, perhaps even a bit baffled, by the presentations that explored the blues linkages in hip hop. Others took offense to statements by presenters that the blues is black music, and they countered by their expressing their belief that the music belongs to everybody, somewhat like those t-shirts you see at the festivals, not black, not white, just blues, right? Um, along with those who argued for the music's universality were those who came out directly to argue that blacks had turned their backs on the blues, and it is mainly white people who are keeping the blues alive. But others among us countered that the blues is indeed a living tradition with footprints all over the map of contemporary pop music, not bound by artificial definitions or debate about what is pure blues and what is not. We can cite hip hop, of course, but also the regional phenomena of soul blues and the recent crop of blues-infused performers like you know, Gary Clark Jr., Nikki Hill, among others. And still another contingent brought up what is called the essentialist position that blues is more than playing or singing notes in a certain way, and that whites could not claim ownership of this music any more than blacks could relinquish it even if they wanted to. So in developing our theme and program for this year. We've tried to make sense of these varied responses. You know, where did they come from? How do they shape our understanding of the blues narrative 
How do they challenge or contribute to meaningful discussion about race, about culture, and what is meant by this blues aesthetic? Our panelists and presenters will address all of these issues over the next 24 hours. Now, at the suggestion of Mark Kamerig, the managing editor of Living Blues Magazine, and the presider of this opening panel, Blues on the Page, we decided to begin this year by stepping back and taking stock. What do we know and what should we know about the blues legacy and who has shaped this narrative? What is the state of blues writing and research today? You know, yesterday we learned of the passing of one of America's greatest storytellers, Maya Angelou. Her words come to mind as we begin this opening plenary. She wrote, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. So let's begin by asking, what stories have been written about the blues and what stories and whose stories still need to be told? The opening plenary brings together a most distinguished group of blues scholars, writers, and critics who have been central to this exploration. I'm going to turn this over to Mark. Thank you, Janice. <laughs> and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I was just going to give a little background first and then introduce our distinguished panel. Um, it, uh, as manager of editing, managing editor of Living Blues, um, we get a lot of material that comes across our desk, of course, and a lot of that um, is the scholarship that's being uh, produced um, in the industry. And one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, so much of it is biographical. It's um, and uh, it'll, it's on house biographies, um, Bobby Bland, um, and. It, it gave me pause to think that, that there's got to be more thought um, that, that, that certainly scholars are looking at things in different ways. Um, there was a recent book that just came out this year, 100 Blues Books, 100 Books That Every Blues Fan Should Own. And it starts in the introduction and it says basically that blues research, and as we know it, starts in 1959, 1960 with Sam Charters and Paul Oliver, uh, two distinguished um, uh, scholars. Uh, but what that told me was that there was certainly work before that, and it's, it's interesting that that wouldn't be considered, um, certainly as part of this, this tome of 100 blues books that every fan should own. Um, I didn't really want to set out, my goal here is not to disparage this book, it's really to kind of look at some of the ideas that, and that in, in taking advantage of this panel, to um, think about um, definitions of the blues, um, examine who is defining these terms, um, who is constructing the blues narrative as we know it, um, and are there problems with that, with that construction? Um, some of this was recently played out, I don't know if anybody saw it in the New York Times Magazine about a month ago, there was a 10 page article, it was the cover story of New York Times Magazine, um, and it was on a very obscure blues artist, Gishi Wiley, um, and I hope that maybe at the end of the panel we can talk a little bit about that. Um, so to wrestle with some of these questions, we've assembled this panel, and my hope is that we can gain some insight um, as we discuss some of their work. Um, each panel, panelist here has um, written uh, various things. We've got artists, poets, writers, and scholars, and I thought together, collectively, maybe we can um, get some conclusions or at least some new questions. Um, and first, I just want to acknowledge uh, Paul Guerin, who can't be with us here tonight, but um, he really was a big part of the inspiration behind um, what we're doing here. Uh, his book, Blues and the Poetic Spirit, um, is really a, a signature a book of blues research, and um, it really it, it, it incorporates a lot of what um, got me excited about this, is that in that um, he just looked at, he, he brings in surrealism, um, and philosophy, and poetry, um, and shows that, that the blues is really a really expansive topic. Uh, but with that, I'll introduce our panel. Um, immediately right here, I've got um, Mr. Lincoln Bochamp. Some of you know him as Chicago Bo. Um, he's a musician, a writer, a teacher. Um, he's written um, a number of 
uh, uh, written for a number of magazines and produced a number of his own, including um, Literata Internationale, which was a, more of a literary journal um, that moved, morphed into the original Chicago Blues Annual, um, which was produced here in Chicago. And most recently in 2010, he produced Blue Speak, which was kind of a greatest hits, best of the Chicago Blues Annual, and I hope to have him talk about that. Next to him, we've got Jim O'Neill. Jim is the founding editor, co one of the co-founding editors of Living Blues Magazine. Um, he's the author of the book Voices of the Blues, and um, currently is working on the Mississippi Blues Trail Marker project um, and producing, uh, I believe to this point, they produced over 200 trail markers in the state of Mississippi. And again, these aren't complete biographies that I'm giving. There's the program. I hope that do more justice than I am. Um, Sandra Pointer Jones, next on our panel. Um, in, in her day job, she works at Cole Taylor Blank, Bank. Um, but uh, she's um, an accomplished writer, written for a number of blues magazines, Living Blues, Blues Access, King Biscuit Time, um, as well as uh, a current or regular contributor to uh, Delmark Records, uh, Liner Notes, and has written an expansive history of Delmark Records on their, on their website. Uh, next to her is Sterling Plump. Sterling Plump uh, is, in my mind, uh, uh, the blues poet um, of our generation. He's an educator, uh, an editor, and a critic. Um, he is uh, a former teacher, at, formerly taught at the uh, taught African American Studies at the University of Illinois in Chicago, uh, and he's author of a number of books of blues poetry, uh, including Home Base, which I hope he'll talk about tonight. Next to him is Gail Dean Wardlow. Uh, Gail Dean is uh, one of the uh, uh, researchers from the 60s that is quite not notable for the, a lot of his discoveries. Um, he contributed to a lot of the blues magazines um, of that time and continues to this day, um, most notably discovering what is believed to be Robert Johnson's uh, death certificate. Um, and he, his book, Chasing That Devil's Music, is a compilation um, of a lot of his research into early blues. And at the end, we have there's uh, Steve Cushing. Uh, many of you may have heard Steve on the radio. He's had his um, uh, radio show, Blues Before Sunrise, for over three decades now. Um, he recently published Blues Before Sunrise, the interviews. Um, and his work that should be coming out very shortly is Pioneers of the Blues Revival, and uh, where he looks at those researchers such as Gail Dean Wardlow uh, from the 60s and some of the work that they did back then. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to start with uh, uh, Sterling. Um, again, uh, because uh, a lot of this was motivated by um, thinking about what Paul Guerin had written about and certainly poetry in that respect. Um, one of the things that, that, that folks have talked about is how blues is an oral tradition, um, but it's also very much a literary tradition. And that's why I was, I was taken aback when, you say, when folks say that, that blues research starts in 1960. Um, that really negates, for example, the Harlem Renaissance um, and writers like that that may have influenced um, you. Um, but with respect to, to the book that I'm talking about, uh, one of your books, Home Base, um, I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about that book. I know it was it kind of described w musician Willie Kent. Um, maybe you could talk about the motivation behind that book. Yes, Home Base uh, is a volume of poems. Um, I wrote somewhere between 1988 and 2006. Uh, a period of time when Willie Kent became very visible on the blues scene in Chicago. And part of the reason why I wrote the book, I wanted the blues singer to speak in the book. Uh, I believe that blues singers are as is articulate as jazz musicians, but maybe not necessarily as literate. Literate just means that you show the influence of having read books. Uh, 
I also wanted to speak as directly to the experiences that blues come out of. And, and I think that those experiences are problematic, uh, particularly for those who have the, the, some kind of misconceived notion that a fine musician like Stevie Ray Vaughan should be discussed on the same day with Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters. You know, blues come out of a cultural tradition that the 33,000 different language groups from Africa brought over on slave ships, retained and improvised, and the culture manifests itself initially in religious terms in terms of Negro spiritual, somewhat later in terms of sermons and, 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 and prayers. And about a hundred years ago, it took the form of jazz written down. Most people who talk about the blues think about somebody with a guitar. And I think about Louis Armstrong. The, the written side of blues goes back to the 1920s, two African Americans who were very prominent, one Langston Hughes, who was the first African American to live on the dormitory at Columbia University in 1920. His father was very wealthy landowner from Mexico City. The other one, Sterling Brown, who did his underground graduate work at Williams College, M.A. at Harvard, Ph.D. at Harvard in 1933. Langston Hughes wrote the Weary Blues in 1926, Fine Clothes to the Jew in 1928. Sterling Brown wrote Southern Road in 1931. One other comment. Part of the problem with understanding the blues can be attributed to the difficult task that educated blacks faced after the Civil War in educating the African American. They wanted an American citizen, not someone dragging along memories of slavery, so that the result of it, and if you want to read it, it's in the preface to Negro Spirits by James Well and Johnson, volume one and volume two, is that they originally did not want Negro spiritual song at all. However, when they became a worldwide hit after the Fifth Jubilee City, singers went to Europe in what, maybe 1880, 1883, obviously the Negro middle class, you know that's a fine car. That has never happened with the blues. Somewhat later, it did happen with jazz when these French writers, Fonacia and Hodier, began to write about what they considered swing. Uh, Thomas A. Dorsey even says that when he developed gospel and he would go to black church trying to sell sheet music, not one preacher ever called him up to sell the sheet music. And however, however, <laughs> when the minister saw what was happening at the national gospel conferences, of course they thought that gospel was good music because they had a lot of people singing it. Uh, what, what African Americans felt, particularly the educated class of African Americans, they felt that they need to prove to black people that they could compete with whites in terms of meritocracy. So speaking of language, so hence between 1875 and about 1930, you have what are some people call a talented tent, raised men, raised 
women, the Barack Obamas of their day, the W.B. Du Bois, uh, they studied it. In terms of blues, because when you sing blues, you're speaking in the vernacular of people that some people call, like myself, country. You, you know, the country implies you don't know how to dress. You, you cannot cross the T's and, and, and dot the I's. And still, when you watch the Cosby show, um, you don't see that celebrated. In fact, in the, as late as the 1950s, the great Howard University would not allow jazz concerts on the campus. It's a fact, you know. And so you, you, you get this. The other problem that you have, it's not that whites are writing about the blues. It's that they're writing so badly about it, you know. Uh, uh, they, they, they write as if there's no science called anthropology. In the beginning, in what, 1935, Melville Huskabis wrote that pioneering work called Myth of the Negro Path, where he documents that the slaves who came to the New World retained African culture. There was another man, Lorenzo Dow Turner, did the same thing with language. Then, more recently, Robert Ferris Thompson, a European anthropologist, and I think the only one to ever be admitted to a secret drumming cult in Ghana, teaches at Yale, wrote the book Flash of the Spirit. Paul Carter Harrison, the drummer of No More. There are a number of works, and we are in a university, and you cannot teach in a course without a bibliography, that documents that African American culture, blues, Negro spiritual, the way people pray has, is, a, is on a continuum that leads back to Africa. And most of the uh, writers don't write about it. You know, uh, they write as if I've got a problem and I write a song, so it's blues. No, you got a problem song. <laughs> the blues refers to a specific cultural way of expressing. Southern whites, because you listen to the same culture, does better at that than any of uh, the other people. You, you know, I mean, I mean I, and I understand entertainment. You, 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 you know what I mean? You know, I, I understand you do whatever it, 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 it takes to uh, be popular. But let me take the case of literature. If you think I'm coming down hard, you know, here's this black cat trying to say white folks can't say anything blue. The fact of the matter is, if you want to talk about, I'm a writer, that there's no way in the world you will ever be compared to Hemingway and Faulkner. They define the literature. If you want to go back to the next century, well then it's, it, you know, it's Mark Twain and Melville. Have you heard of those people? The, the, the people who invented and does it the best, they call that canonic. And, 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 and part of the, 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 these discussions, it should not take a racial connotation. I simply feel that Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker is in a class that nobody else is in. And it's not just whites that's not in it. There are no blacks that are living, I think, is in that class. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? They, they're out there playing something. They ain't playing no blues at that level. And, Festivals that don't somehow feel that 95% of the people um, that they invite should be non-African Americans. I think it's an insult to African Americans because I think what's at stake here is the fact that if you look at America culturally, I don't think the European has done anything to match Negro spiritual, blues, jazz, and gospel, and that's why I end my case. Thank, thank you, Strong. <laughs> and, and we'll try and save some time at the end, of course, for questions. 
Um, I'd like to move on uh, to uh, Jim O'Neill. Uh, Jim, of course, you, you had uh, Living Blues Magazine. You were the editor for over a decade um, plus, and you had your book, Voice of the Blues. Um, but you're also involved with the Mississippi Blues Trail Markers. Um, and I know the, the topic here is, is blues on the page, um, but of course the page is changing. Now we have the internet, and you can look at all of these blues trail markers um, on the internet. And uh, it's arguably it's an important part of, of blues history for the, for the general uh, public. And I'm wondering um, how that project came about and um, who decides the content of these markers? Well, I think the project came about because uh, I, was, I lived in Mississippi for a number of years in Clarksdale and Marigold and earlier on the Gulf Coast. And, and uh, during the time I was in Clarksdale in particular, um, people would notice uh, strangers on the street uh, from uh, Belgium or Japan and wonder why they were there and why they were always going across the tracks to the other neighborhoods and where, from where they lived. And, and finally, f people figured out that people, wanted, that people around the world wanted to know about Mississippi's blues heritage and they wanted the real thing. They wanted to go to the, to the juke joints, to the African-American communities and not hear the imitations. And, and Mississippi was, was where it was still happening. Of course, it's still happening here and lots of other places too. And I think that's kind of what woke Mississippi up to the fact that they could promote the blues. You know, you know, you have to be honest that the conditions in Mississippi gave rise to the blues. So now it's kind of ironic that the same state would turn around and promote it. But uh, so, but we have to be grateful for what blessings that has brought us, pose. Uh, but you have to realize uh, the history of it too. But. One of the things we try to do on in the text of the Blues Trail Markers is, is, is to present that history honestly and, uh, you know, the, the history of oppression and racism and the plantation system and how it, the blues developed out of that. And uh, the state, and no one has ever tried to censor any of the text, so some of that uh, history is uh, explained on these historical markers. You know, we did one on J.B. Lenore, who was notorious, notoriously outspoken about his views on civil rights and the treatment of, of black people in Mississippi and Alabama. So there's a marker about him that, that tells that story. Um, and there was originally a panel of uh, scholars and uh, people from different universities, uh, Mississippi Valley State and Memphis State, uh, Ole Miss, and uh, it was a, a mixed mixed racial panel that uh, decided on the first 100 markers, and then since then, when new new uh, suggestions come up, there we discuss them among ourselves, and uh, a lot of the suggestions come from communities that you wouldn't that don't really have a written blues history, so we have to kind of construct the histories. Uh, there, people know that blues came from Clarksdale or Jackson, but there was also blues in Pascagoula and Ackerman and New Albany and Coldwater. And there's, so it's been a real uh, challenge and real a lot of fun, actually, to try to find the history, the blues history of those communities. Is, is there any uh, issue or conflict with the fact that the state kind of promotes it as a tourism um, as, as opposed to, say, from a strict kind of academic standpoint? Or is there any influence there? Well, obviously, the, you know, the state wouldn't support it if it wasn't, there wasn't some economic uh, benefit to it, you know, to try to draw tourists to, to the state. Um, but the content of the markers, you know, is not tourist oriented. I mean, it, it is, you know, try, we try to be as historically accurate and honest as possible with it. So. Um, you know, they're not advertising, they're not advertisements, they're actual stories about what happened. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to move on to, uh, to Chicago Bow. Um, uh, Mr. Bochamp, you, you had, uh, your recent book was uh, Blue Speak, which was kind of a, a greatest hits, if you will, of, of your original uh, Chicago Blues Journal. Um, and uh, I was wondering, not so much the book, but going back to the original magazine, um, what was what was your motivation for producing this magazine? What what was the landscape at that time, or what 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 motivated you to, to get it to get it done? Uh, 
thanks. Um, initially, um, we wanted the, uh, the Blues Annual to be a, a resource, um, along with a few uh, you know, uh, writings, poetry, and, and uh, short stories, and things like that. And so the, the original one was called, I think, Musician's Guide to uh, Blues in Chicago or Resources. It, it's a subtitle like that. And um, interestingly enough, we, we found that um, musicians really weren't particularly interested in, in resources <laughs> because the conditioning was not to share what you knew. It's like the old um, crabs in a barrel concept. You know. So suddenly I'm, I'm on the scene with a magazine with every single agent, every radio station, every way to get a gig I can think of. And people are actually telling me, well, we don't need this. No. Because they have been so clammed up about if you did get a job or you did get paid. So I realized that, that the situation had not evolved, at least in my mind, uh, much off of uh, just being fresh off a of plantation where everybody was wondering, you know, how am I going to survive? If I tell him or her, uh, that's going to, you know, cut into my potential earnings. So we moved from being more of a resource guide to combining my other uh, magazine, we made it more of a, a literary slash uh, black diaspora based music slash blues magazine. And um, I had always felt that, that uh, black culture, when it had been handled by non-black people, uh, had been dissected like laboratory rats and something of that nature. So uh, it was all spread out all over the place. So the, the Chicago Blues Annual, we would publish uh, well-known uh, writers like Harley Roy Bibbs out of the 60s movement, alongside of interviews with Junior Wells. Um, had we kept going, we would have had uh, Romare Bearden and Jacob Lawrence uh, alongside Maya Angelou, who Maya was, was one of our you know, laid back, behind the scenes supporters. So what I wanted to do with the magazine was also, because uh, I didn't see anybody else doing it, uh, was to reach out beyond Chicago. And uh, we did that by translating articles into Italian, into French, uh, some stuff in Yoruba, uh, and in Spanish, one issue. And uh, that had a great reception. I mean, great reception. And to give you an idea about just how people perceive black culture outside of here, I think. I always take a lot of flack for saying that. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't buy you know, big money advertisers, but Alitalia, the national airline of Italy, stepped up, bought the back cover for five years. You know, where was American, where was United? Iceland Air, two years of, of full page ads and cash, in-kind plane tickets. You know, what was Delta, you know, in the Delta, you know, <laughs> in, in, their, in their thinking. So I realized that, that the world, that, that a magazine that was owned and operated, edited by an African-American person or, or African Indian Americas uh, had a lot of potential. And so we reached out and as a result of that, we started producing the magazine, uh, festivals in Sardinia, uh, it, was, it, it got to be really great by the third or fourth issue, by 92, 93. And people were asking me here, well, why are you, why are you put it in French? This is an American thing, you know. And that's the point, you know, uh, I think the blues is a great liberator. And I think that what blues people have to really realize, what I try to, to make people realize here, is that the blues, in a way, is Euro, a vehicle for Euro-Americans, for non-people of color, to purge their Judeo-Christian guilt. <laughs> I mean, nothing else that they got sets them free. And then, you know, all the devil's music, you know. But, you know, you transfer that guilt, you know. And the blues man feels like, I can't really step out completely the way I want to step out, you know. And he, res and he respects the person to some extent. You know, they're all subservient, not all in some sort of way. Believe me, they're the most ignorant, the most 
profoundly ignorant white folks are smarter than they are, have something on them. And so with the Blues Annual, we created real integrity in the culture. We made black people look up and say, this is what it is, and say, don't let these folks dump on your back, because every, everything that they have in that Judeo thing, have you ever walked into a church and seen a smiling Jesus? A, a smiling saint? All of them, well, head all down, necks all twisted to one side, and, and guilt. I thought, I, suppose, I thought love was a joyful thing. So that's what we did. And let me say, I always get a lot of interesting discussion about this because I think I, I see what's, what's real, what's real in this Western society. You know, the, the ones who are the slaves, the ex-slaves, are the ones who had the guilt transferred to them, the blues. That's not that. Thank you. Um, Sandra, I'd like to turn to you next. Um, you, you've told me that, that basically, with, with all of the writing that you've done, you, you kind of consider yourself a storyteller. Um, and I was wondering um, how, how you decide on who you might profile and um, uh, are you telling this, how, how do you decide to tell the story of the musician? Um, well, I, I came uh, to writing um, uh, based on um, a verbal history of uh, my family. Um, that's what made it interesting to me. Um, I used to listen to my mom tell stories about her childhood, listen to uh, my father, my aunts, my uncles. And um, when I came into the blues, um, those are the people that I saw. They weren't my, my, my aunts, my uncles, but they looked like my aunts and my uncles. And so um, there's no particular person that I'm really interested in. Um, I just look at them, listen to them, and I know that they have a story. Everyone has a story. Um, and so I approach it that way because everyone wants to tell someone about their self. Uh, everyone wants to tell what they did when they were a kid, what made them happy, what made them sad. Um, you know, the first day that they picked a flower, the first day that they picked up a guitar. Um, you know, when they got a whooping for messing with their dad's guitar. Um, those are stories that um, lurch out at, uh, at people. And that's how I came to the blues. That's how I approached it. Um, the music took, took me, of course, but um, I am a, a natural listener of stories, and I felt as long as I'm listening to these stories, I might as well let someone else hear these stories as well. Um, that's how I felt about it. Did you, in your mind, do you, do you have a definition of blues and such that it kind of shapes who you might consider you know, to write about? Um, I, I do believe that, um, that blues is a culture. I, I, I feel that um, it, it, um, it is an extension of the African-American um, uh, 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 emotion, um, their history, uh, and I, I, I do believe that um, it still continues, um, but most of the people in this room, probably most of the people on this panel would not agree with me on how it still extends, hip hop, um, churches, um, how we dress, how we act, um, our, our vernacular, um, uh, our, our phrases, our sayings, in, in my opinion, that is blues. That is just, it, it's just an extension of it. Um, one thing that makes me sad uh, as far as music is concerned is I see all genres growing. Um, they grow and they get wider and they get broader, um, but it looks like blues is stagnant. Uh, and, and I feel that is because we're, we're, we're not allowing it to, to grow naturally. We're kind of keeping it caged in. Um, it, it, it grew out of the African-American experience. Well, African-Americans are still experiencing things, and, and that's what's holding it in. Yeah. Th thank you. Um, I'd like to move on uh, in, uh, with uh, Steve Cushing. Um, you certainly, uh, you had your book, Blues Before Sunrise, which was a collection of interviews. Um, but for this discussion, I want to, uh, like I said, I want to focus on the Pioneers of the Blues Revival, which is your forthcoming book on Illinois Press. Um, 
and I was wondering if you one just kind of describe what what the book is and then what was your motivation behind it okay um, first of all <clears throat> and whatever we go I want to apologize I was trying to talk while they were doing the sound check and my voice crapped out so I'm gonna do the best I can 40 years on radio and now I can't speak in front of a microphone uh, I, I um, when I first discovered blues in high school, I started doing what most of the, the white folks who, who got involved in it did. They bought a record, and then they read the liner notes, and they followed the trail of names that were listed there. They would list other artists. I would run and buy that record. And uh, I, I should say before I go any further that it's too bad that Paul Guerin is not here because the guy who played the record that just spoke to me and started me off on this journey was Paul Guerin when he was a clerk at Barbara's bookstore. I walked in and it was just uh, a moment that transformed me. And I'm, I'm sorry I can't tell Paul in person. But anyways, I started following this trail, not only buying records, but running across the magazines uh, among the people that I met uh, earliest in, in my adventures were Jim O'Neill and his then wife Amy and they had just put out the among the I think they were in issue number five or six there was a Snooky Pryor magazine and my, my point is that as I as I explored the music there were a series of names that did the magazines the books the records <clears throat> and they were names we became familiar with, Paul Oliver, Sam Charters, Gail Dean Wardlow here, uh, you know. And then there were the record companies, uh, Delmark Records, uh, Arhuli Records with Chris Strockwitz, uh, Folkway was with uh, Mose Ash, uh, OJL, Pete Whalen. And slowly but surely, all these names, all these people and their work, uh, really became my heroes. And many, many times over the years, I thought, God, it would really be great to get to meet all these people and to document them. And of course, I put it off and put it off and put it off. And we got to the point where uh, a couple of them had, had died. And I just thought, well, I, I have to do it now or never. And so um, I had about four interviews just on the radio program, Galen came to town, and he and I sat down and did an extended session. Bob Kester, who's always been my musical mentor, my number one musical mentor, uh, always turned me on to things that I, I wasn't familiar with, always oftentimes would give me freebies and say, here, do you have this in the collection? And I can't thank you enough for that, Bob. But Bob and I did a 50th anniversary interview, didn't we? And so I had that, Mike Rowe came to town, and Ray Fleur Lodge came over. So I had four interviews, and I sat down and I made a list. I said, what would it take? Who should I include in this? And who do I have to go out and talk with still? So I made up a list, and the linchpin in all of this was Paul Oliver, who I think most people regard as perhaps the foremost writer-researcher of this era. Uh, starting in the late 50s and going into the throughout the 1960s. So I just called Paul up and said, Paul, would you do an extended sit down interview with me over the phone? And he agreed. And I, I knew that uh, once I had the Paul Oliver interview, it was just a matter of filling in the numbers. And so one guy led to another. Almost all of them, I have 10 Americans, five Brits, one guy from France, and uh, Chris Strockwitz, who actually was a child during World War II, a German refugee who settled here. And uh, the guy's almost 80 years old, and he swears like a seventh grader. But it, his interview was the most fun that I did out of, out of all of these. A couple of the guys, other people have, have tried this project, and they've bothered the same people that I've talked to, but there were never any results they never saw anything in print. So when I approached a lot of these people, Bob Dixon, who did the pre-war discography and lives in Australia, 
said, no, I don't think I can do it. And uh, uh, Sam Charters also was very hesitant to talk to me. But other, other blues authorities had really been beating Sam Charters up. And, and they thought that I just wanted to come and spank him some more. And I was trying to convince him, you tell your own story in your own words, and I'm going to write exactly what you say. I, I should say that the, the books that I do, I'm not a writer. I like to think that I do good interviews, but I transcribe the interviews, and I don't write anything myself. So uh, if there was anything in there that you objected to, you said it. I didn't, I didn't do it. So, so charters, I chased charters for a year, and I, I consider charter maybe one of the two titans of this era, Paul Oliver and Sam Charters. And Paul or, or Sam wanted to do this, but he was afraid I was going to beat him up. Finally, I sent him an email and I said, Sam, can't you feel my lips on your ass? And, and that's what turned the trick. So Sam agreed to do it. And it might have been the, the best interview that he talked for three hours on the phone internationally. AT&T really made some money me, off me on that one. But uh, that's, that's actually what I'm, I'm doing, mm -hmm. you know. And, and the book, it's been four years, and it's supposed to be out any second now. And check with them tomorrow and see if it comes in. Um, thanks. Uh, it kind of to tie in, I'd like, Gail Dean, um, you're certainly one of the people that um, Steve is kind of talking about. Um, you were uh, there in the 60s doing a lot of the research that so many people have, have turn to, to learn about Robert Johnson or a Charlie Patton or even some more obscure artists. Um, and it's, it's interesting, having, having known you a little bit, I know that, that you were initially interested in uh, Texas Swing and, and Bob Wills and, and those were the 78s you were collecting. And at some point you started uh, collecting blue 78s and it became um, certainly a passion. And um, I'm wondering what was, what was the, kind of the driving force because you not only became a record collector, but then you became a researcher. And I'm wondering what prompted that. Well, thank you. I want to say this. This is going to be a great book because it's not just because I'm in it. It's because so many people are in it. So go buy a copy, and Illinois Press will do more books like that. And, and also, I wanted to say, Galen, Galen was one of my, my guides in this whole thing. I said, well, who else should I talk to? I didn't even know who Pete Whalen was. So you need to talk to Pete Whalen. You need to talk to Dick Spotsworth. You know, I mean, I, re I recognize the names, but you're the guy who, who put me in touch with all of them. Okay. It I'm sounds like a Roman Abner show, doesn't it? Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I had a, the great fortune of being in Mississippi in 1961. I had collected Roy A. Cuff records and Bob Wills' Western Swing. And a record dealer told me, he says, I will get you a box of Roy A. Cuff records if you'll find me some old Louis Armstrong or jazz. It dawned on me, I lived at that time, we called it the color quarters. This is very segregated times. So I decided to go door knocking for old blues records. And one day I went door knocking and I went door to door and I finally learned that I asked for Victrola records made by people like Bessie Smith, Lion Lemon, I took the first two records home, I played them. One was a Louis Armstrong backing uh, Bertha Chippy Hill. I liked the record. So then I found some piano records. <clears throat> I mean, I realized that the great Western swing piano players in the 1930s had learned from black piano players in Texas. And then I found a Charlie Patton, couldn't stand him because he was too primitive, but what I decided to do was I kept the records. And then I realized, hey, look, I'm a 21-year-old white boy in Mississippi going to black neighborhoods asking about black blues musicians. Uh, the Klan didn't like me. The Mississippi Sovereignty Commission didn't like me. I'm not trying to brag. But what I was trying to do is I was working as a journalist, as a sports writer, then a news writer. So I came at it from a standpoint of a journalist. What I tried to do was not to find blues, but try to find people who knew these musicians while they were living. Now, this is 1960, so the 1920s, in the Mississippi Delta, very live, live musicians. And the great Delta blues 
is not recorded until the late 1920s. So in 1960, there were people alive who saw Charlie Patton or her son House or a Tommy Johnson, just names on records. But I tried to document the oral history. I got a tape recorder with a battery and started sitting down on sidewalks, uh, on street corners, and just talking. And what I learned was when I talked to the elderly black people, they said, you like this music? I said, I certainly do. And I said, I really appreciate it. And they began sharing these people were heroes to them in their days. I mean, they went to little local places on Saturday night to go to a dance, and you had somebody come play with a guitar. They weren't many piano players except in the big cities like Memphis or Jackson, but these were heroes. So what I was trying to do was document quickly as I could what I could on tape, and I used some journalism tricks. Uh, this, let me tell you something, Robert Johnson was just a name in the 1960s. He became a legend later on through marketing. It was Charlie Patton, it was Sun House, it was Tommy Johnson in the movie Old Brother Where All Thou. So I learned uh, there were death certificates. So I went to the Mississippi Department of Health one day. I walked in and I filed for death certificates for $1 a piece, $4, and I made $10 a week covering high school football games at that time. I filed for Charlie Patton, Willie Brown, Tommy Johnson, and Robert Johnson. They found three of the four. Three years later, we found it on Johnson only because they had the wrong county. But this was interesting because there was no information known on Johnson, where he came from, when he died, how he died, and there's more controversy later. But I found something else that I found. You could go to city directories, newspapers, in big cities like Memphis or in Chicago, especially Memphis or even Jackson, Tommy Johnson and Ishmael Bracey were listed in the city directory as musicians. Now, it always said color, say, in those days. But I knew it was the right Tommy Johnson said musicians. Well, I would do that. Then B.B. King had a cousin named uh, Booker White. Does any of you know that name? His real name was Washington White, and uh, Washington got in a little trouble one time. Uh, he killed a man in the juke house after he made a record. So what I did was I went to the actual county where he was tried, convicted, and it says sentenced to parchment, life in the state penitentiary. Uh, because he made a great record three years later, there were some financial donations made to a governor's campaign, and Booker Washington White was released. And he went to Memphis, then he recorded parchment, prison, blues, and all that. Hey, I don't want to take up too much time. There's a lot of other people. One more, this is outstanding. When I lived in Atlanta, in the 1940s, the Atlanta Constitution published colored obituaries. No white paper did that in the South. There was a great black preacher in Amber, Reverend J.M. Gates. So one day I went through microfilm, and in August of 1945, there was an obituary for Reverend J.M. Gates. Just to show you, this is the kind of research that could be done even in those days, but now they're using Ancestry.com. I was a police reporter. You get out and beat the sidewalks. But, hey, I don't want to say a lot more. Uh, I was fortunate. I was in Mississippi and had the opportunity to write about these guys. And I would ask you to do one thing. I live in Pensacola. I'm going back next week. I found a 102-year-old elderly black man. That means in 1930, he was 18 or 19 years old. I want to find out what kind of records he was listening to. Who was coming through Pensacola from New Orleans? You know, jazz bands came over there. In other words, it's interesting to me what he remembers about his music. So I'd implore any of you, go find elderly people while you can and record their history. If that had been done in 1900, we'd been, you know, a lot better off. But uh, I want to thank you. Hey, I think you should give a hand to Mark over here. I think you should give a hand to everybody in the panel. And I think you should give a hand to Dr. Dennis Monty over here. And look, I'm serious. It's time to give everyone a hand. And buy Steve Cushing's book. Thank you. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions if there are any for the panel. <laughs> well, I've actually I've got one uh, from uh, my own. Um, Gail Dean and, and, and Steve, uh, 
basically all of us can maybe have an idea about it, but one of the outgrowths of, of your research um, in the, in, because you and so many other researchers like you were prolific in the 60s and 70s, um, has that, has your research uh, kind of defined the blues? And, and you hear this term, for example, real blues. I know that there's a, on the website, on, on the internet, I'm gonna sound like I'm 90 years old. Um, on, on the internet, uh, there's a, uh, uh, the Real Blues Forum, which has about 10,000 people contributing bits of blues history in that um, on a regular basis. And I'm wondering, um, do, do you feel that, that your research has kind of defined blues to, to the detriment of, of, of the music so that, so that we, it's, the, the, the definition is too narrow for too many people? Well, that takes about four hours. No, we don't. Um, I don't know if it's changed. You know, what I always try to do is try to document the musicians and the music. Then people who are guitarists, you know, try to document the music. Everything is different now with the internet that you can do as far as research. But everyone has their champion, whether it be uh, gospel or uh, blues or jazz or hillbilly, old timey music. I think the best definition, I don't know, the best definition of blues I ever heard was in, it was Willie Brown who said, the blues ain't nothing but a low down, shake and chill. If you ain't never had them, hope you never will. So that's a good definition of blues. Blues is when you, and another black man that I recorded one time, he said, you know, he said, the blues ain't nothing but a good man feeling bad. You got trouble about your woman, you got troubles uh, about her, you got the blues. If you're a woman, you got troubles. You're a man, you got the blues. If you ain't got no money, you got the blues. But most of blues is about personal relationships, and it's done by whites, black, green, and yellow. It doesn't matter. If you got a soul, if you got feelings, sometimes you're gonna have the blues. And uh, I don't know how to answer your question, Mark. Exactly. It, it, well, no, I appreciate it. And one other uh, question I had was, um, and this is kind of open for the panel because I know some of you are educators, but if you had a young scholar that, that wanted to pursue study in the blues, what, what areas or what focus might, you know, what direction might you point them in? So that, that you know, needs more research, needs to be understood better, needs to be revised. Um, well, I, I, I can give you Gosh, I think other people can answer that better. Uh, oh, you I take was, the basics, you know, you take was, the basic information and uh, you work from that. And I think you should go out and do as much oral history as you can while people are still alive. You know, you were talking about your mother, what she had to say, you know, ask your mother, your grandmothers, find out what music they heard. And I don't, you know, I think Sterling could answer it. Sterling, you got a point there, go ahead. The point is, I mean, it might have been 36 or 37, there were 49 volumes of testimonies of ex-slaves it's called Slave Biography. I think it was edited by a man by the name of Redfield. In the 49th volume deals with the con, uh, conversionary experiences of African Americans, and that is called God Stuck Me Dead. But the other thing I want to say, some of the keenest observers of African-American culture has been the major African-American writers. One, Ralph Ellison, National Book Award, 1952 for Invisible Man, 1964, Shouter and Act. You know, he defines blues. Two, Sterling Brown had two students at Howard University. He would lecture on blues, jazz, and gospel, and Howard University told him that they could not make that kind of lecture there. And so he would go to dormitories at night and lecture. And the two students that he produced, one was the prominent poet, playwright, Leroy Jones slash Amira Baraka. The other one is less known, a man by the name of A.V. Spellman, who wrote the book Four Lives, in the bebop 
business. Now, the thing that I have about people talking about blues, well then how do you connect it to Africa? That's why you need to go to these anthropologists. That's what anthropologists do. You know, they go to Ghana. <laughs> you know, they go to Nigeria. They come back to this country, they go to Cuba. They go to Brazil. The interesting thing about the United States, it was a penalty of death if African Americans had a drum, if African Americans spoke the African language of worship in that way. It was a penalty of death. You should read a book called Roll Jordan Roll by Eugene Genovese. And in describing the rain shout, he said the slaves would go way out in the woods. He said in the cabins where they would practice these rituals, they would turn a pot upside down. The other thing I want to say is a recognition. Somewhere in 1980, I met this young man all up and down the streets of 79th Street in these juke joints. And I sort of thought that uh, he was crazy. And I asked him who he was. He told me that he was a student from France. Some 15 years later, he came to me with a 1,100-page document, you know, and I looked at it, and I think it uh, said theatricality of the blues, and I looked at it a little bit more closely, and it says the University of Paris. And then I had to take another look, and I think the, 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 the woman who had signed the dissertation was a woman by the name of Jim, uh, Genevieve Fogg. One of the outstanding scholars, not writers about blues, is Dr. Jacques Lacava. He sat back there. I think he's in business now, you know. PhD. I mean, I, he had to, I thought he brought this uh, dissertation to me in a wheelbarrow. It was so big and so heavy. Dr. Jacques Lacava there. The Ch Chicago Bow, you were going to to the question of, of where you might direct a young scholar, what, um, did you have any, I thought, I, I thought, yeah, yeah. you were Well, um, I think it's, it's, it's a profoundly intricate endeavor to study. I guess uh, Jacques is, has, has done, you know, uh, a very interesting work, and in, I haven't read it, but I know he's a thorough man. Uh, for sure, and I know he put a lot of time into it, but you know, it, it's like going to live, uh, you know, uh, among the uh, Mongolians for 20 years and trying to decide now that, that you, you are uh, some, a master of Mongolian culture. You know? So I, I think that to come to understand the blues at this point in its evolution, uh, you have to go back the way. Uh, Sam Charters and others, Paul Oliver, uh, these people have documented certain things. They're collectors of information. They're not collectors of spirit. They're not collectors of souls. I think they'd like to be. <laughs> but they collected information. And they put information in such a way where it's accessible to people. Because you can't really research certain kinds of culture. You have to live it. You have to live it. And no matter how long, how long I put on a dress and walk around and go, I ain't gonna be no woman. I mean, you got to put some things in black and white that's like that. Because I have seen folks, you know, d determine themselves to be blues people because they knew Albert King, because they spent time in Muddy Waters. So, I, I, you know, it, it comes to the point of, if you want an education about something, then you have to study it, but you'll never be able to live it. It's been lived, and it's being lived by certain people. The blues is, is this ongoing, and I've always held that 90% of blues people don't play a note. They're living it. They're, they're living the experience. You know, our art just, it comes out in just, just different ways, photography and the quilt making. 
in, in painting, not necessarily always in music, but the soul that drives us to create, that spirit, that's, that's the thing you have to be born with, have to live it, be in a certain environment, what it says, right? Uh, I'd like to add something if I can. This here. I, I think that the, uh, the notion, I, I, in all the years that I spent around bluesmen working as a musician, I never heard any two bluesmen discuss what the blues were. I, mean, I think they already knew what they were. And I don't think the question ever came up until the first white guy said, what are the blues? And I always had envisioned this, this thing Maybe Studs Terkel is talking to Big Bill Brunzi, and they're having this conversation, and you know, Big Bill wants to inform him about things that have gone on, and the first question that Studs asks is, Big Bill, what are the blues? And Big Bill in his own mind is, is like in a panic, and he's thinking, what the hell is this guy asking me? What are the blues? And so he just makes up some silly ass answer, like, you know, it's a bare light bulb in the midnight air or something. <laughs> And Studs goes, really? And he, he, like, he buys into it 100%. And I just think that's been going on for years and years. And I, I hope that there's enough guys around doing research that know not to even bother with that, you know? Uh, question? For me, um, I, I think you ha it has to be done organically. Uh, um, whatever you want to teach a child, you can't shove it down its throat. No matter what it is, whether it's blues or math, you can't shove it down a, a, a child's throat. It has to be organic. Um, I, I have uh, uh, an adult son who loves music just as much as I love music, um, and he, he knows this music just because it, it was around him. Uh, I, I played it um, every Sunday, uh, uh, every Saturday at my house when I was a kid it was played. Any other time it wasn't because my mother was very religious, but on Saturday she would let us <laughs> let our hair down. Um, so it, it, it was organic for him. It was organic for us. Um, my mother, as I said, would tell these stories. It wasn't sit down, I want to tell you this, I want to learn you this, you have to know this. It wasn't that, it was just, oh yeah, I remember, oh, you, you guys do that. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, blah, blah, blah. And we learned it organically. That's what we have to do to teach our children. We can't dismiss what they do um, as, as, as not viable because they will reject us. They will absolutely reject us. Now his children are doing the same thing. He's doing the same thing to them. He's teaching them just by talking about it. Again, blues is oral history. It is, it is the culture of African Americans. Um, and that's not to say that uh, um, any other uh, uh, race um, does not know anything about blues. Um, just organically, that's, in my opinion, what blues is and how you can move it to the next level. Don't dismiss a child when he wants uh, um, to uh, uh, do a, a rock lick uh, versus, you know, a, a, a open Spanish tune. Don't don't dismiss it. Let it happen. Mark, right, let me say one thing. Very good. 
there is one thing that concerns me uh, about blues is that African Americans, particularly the ones who are responsible for the education of black people, somehow has to wrestle the discourse of blues away from the entertainment industry. There are two things going on. You, know, you have the entertainment industry talking about who is in the top 20, who makes X amount of money, has absolutely no knowledge of, or had absolutely nothing to do with the development of Negro spirituals, jazz abuse. They, 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 they recorded it, you know, and people always ask me, many of those people in the recording industry would be just like if you take an orangutan <laughs> or a chimpanzee and you send him in a diamond mine and he'd come out smiling with a diamond in his hand and I'd hit him over the head with a crowbar because he doesn't know how to cut it. It has not been done correctly and you should have lectures on that. That's number one. Number two, with respect, with respect to the festival, the African American community pay taxes, so, so, so at the level of discourse, small groups, there ought to always be some lectures with concerts in the African American community to explain it. You know, uh, acoustic blues, muddy waters, or what, what's called soul, going downtown, buying a, a hamburger, uh, or watching some headliner, get all excited because you know a few notes on guitar, that, that does not do it. That does not do it. Uh, the, the peculiar thing about African American history, and most people don't know it, the leading experts in African American history in this country has always been African American. There is nobody more knowledgeable about African American history than John Hope Franklin and W. B. Du Bois. Nobody. Nowhere. But see, it's a stretch to take this cultural phenomenon, which is brilliant, which many African Americans are ambivalent about. You know, I have friends who are lawyers. You, you know, you know. Last time I was down, there, we paid seventy-five dollars to go to a blues concert, and then we got in almost to a fist fight because I told them, you can't have a blues concert where 95% of the people cannot come. What's wrong with you? You know, you know, and you, you, you need more discourse and African-American intellectuals have to take more responsibility because blues should be a part of African-American culture when you are dealing with, uh, with identity. You have to have books. There's, I mean, rather than blues in the schools, you have to divide, the, develop a program and have people, blues singers, go into classrooms with some kind of script that describes what it is. You have to expose them to it. You know, in my case, uh, when my daughter was four years old, I paid Billy Branch uh, to come and play harmonica for her, and the, and the rascal wouldn't even give me a discount. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, see, it's, it's, it's serious. We, we, we're speaking about culture. You know, the people I admire the most in the world, and I will do it as I die, is Jewish, but how did they retain their culture all those years? Number one, they're literate, absolutely literate. And, 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 and number two, they're brilliant at discourse. You know, the, the, the interesting thing about blues, see, I have never had a problem with whites making money on the blues. My problem was 
I wish somebody would sing them for them. You know, it's they, they, not that good. You, you, know, you, know, you know how I'm watching this performance on NBC? No, no, no. You, there's no choir in the class. I mean, I mean, you know, the people are crying when they sing the blues. The same way they do in churches, they don't, they want to sing the blues without mastering African American culture. And, 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 and that has to be taken to children. I will tell you what's happening in African American life with the hip hop generation that I think is very, very dangerous. There are a lot of people will look at a hip hop artist. I mean, they're not great entertainers, but they will say that the fact that you are illiterate, no. you don't know anything about African American culture, is a good thing. It's, see, it's hard for me to tell someone that slaves produce better music than you are producing. The people in segregation produce better music than you are producing. There is never any excuse for anybody not being excellent. There's never any excuse for, for, for someone in the 21st century being ambivalent about understanding English when Frederick Douglass, a slave, did that brilliantly. And so people apologize to them the, 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 the education has been decreased. People are playing music without an instrument, don't know anything about music. And some people will say, well, you know, they are our baby. I don't know. You know, I came through the civil rights movement, and the people who led it was the most brilliant students on the meritocracy scale. That's why it was successful. That's why it was successful. Stokely Carmichael, those people were destined for Harvard. You engage with a society as sophisticated as the United States, you make one mistake, you might go down forever. They are doing things to black people now. The education doesn't work. They are shooting them down. Uh, jurors are <laughs> finding that they're, you know, oh, that's probable cause because he's black, he had a gun. So all that nonsense stops if you begin to, to analyze it and begin to impeach judgment. Black people are going to have to, at some point, take charge of it. It's hard because they call you a racist. One last point. You know, I, I have been in a university, I taught in the university for 30 years. And we met with the, the, with the president of the university every month for 10 years. And see, this man was white, and he was so arrogant, he would put his feet up on the desk and, and chit-chat with us. And one day, he came, he said, what do you want me to do about racism? We said, we don't want you to do a thing about racism. Well, then he said, what do you want? We said, we want you to hire 100 black people. And you know, you should have seen his eyes and all that, that, that stuff. He said, we can't find that many, and we gave him a hundred different convictions. <laughs> you know, it, it's a game that's being run on African Americans because the way you are always controlled, you're dispossessed, number one. The person that does the hiring, that's all they have to do. You know, if a professor does something to you, well, why would you go to the president of the university and he, they just hired that clown. They knew who he was when they hired him. That is absent in African Americans, part of getting a representative in the White House means that you have to be colorblind about racism. You know, it, you know, it really does not exist. You know, no, 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 no things are better. Hell, they, they're, they're the lynching black kids all over the country. You know, things gonna get better. They never get better until you do something about it. And African Americans are failing to insist on education, and you cannot, and will never have a healthy climate of the blues. Blues always existed in climates where there was full employment and not in the kind of climates that deteriorated, you know? And blues were never the only choice of music for black people. 
I mean, I mean the people keep going on, all oh, the blues are dying. Dying, they ain't dying. Yeah. And, and with that, Sterling, we're going to have to wrap it up. But thank you so much, for the panel members. I appreciate it. And thank you, the audience. And we'll move on to the awards. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We, we never have enough time to explore the themes and, and discussions like this, but we'll take some more time in the next uh, day or so to come back to some of these issues. And uh, I urge you to return tomorrow. We've got a number of panels and presentations throughout the day that are going to follow up on some of the important ideas that have been presented here. But now it is time for the Spirit Award presentation. So it is my pleasure to present a very responsive and wise university president uh, of the president of Dominican University, Donna M. Carroll. It's really under President Carol stewardship the symposium has been made possible and I want to personally thank Donna for supporting this rather out of a box uh, endeavor that accords the blues the attention that it deserves. Uh, I also want to thank the administration and in particular Dean Jeffrey Carlson of the Rosary College of Arts and Sciences for recognizing the connection between these kinds of endeavors, these kinds of symposia, and the university's mission in a more just and humane world. Ladies and gentlemen, President Carroll. Good evening, everyone. And it's my delight to add my welcome to Janice Monti. It's wonderful to see such a large crowd enjoying such a wonderful evening. So it's my responsibility to announce the 2014 Spirit Awards. Our first award goes to Robert G. Kester. Oh, you can run. There's a step there. Bob Kester is simply one of the most important figures in the modern day Chicago blues and jazz recording industry. For decades, he has fought the good fight to keep recorded music alive and kicking. He has drawn thousands of devoted jazz fans to his music mecca at the Jazz Record Mart and recorded some of the country's greatest blues musicians on his visionary Delmark label. Since moving to Chicago from St. Louis in 1958, Bob has dedicated himself to collecting, recording, selling, and reselling the music of seminal but often unsung artists. His Delmark record studio, the oldest independent jazz and blues record label in the country, second oldest, <laughs> revitalized the careers of legendary artists and introduced them to a new generation of reverential fans, including an ever-growing white audience. Although Bob's recording label initially focused on traditional stripped-down acoustic artists, his groundbreaking release in 1965 of harpist Junior Wells' electrified Hoodoo Man Blues and Magic Sam's 1967 West Side Soul introduced to a wide audience a new genre-bending sound combining elements of ragtime, jazz, blues, and soul. Today, the label is the home of some of the world's leading contemporary blues and jazz artists. Even as, it re, even as its reissues of, of vintage era recordings remain an important part of its operation. Bob has served as a mentor to such important music entrepreneurs as Bruce Ignauer, Ignauer of Alligator Records, Michael Frank of Earwig Music, and Jim O'Neill of Rooster Records and Living Blues Magazine, all of whom or which 
worked for him at one time. With his wife, Susan, a former Dominican University student, and son, Robert Joseph, by his side, Bob continues to operate the Jazz Record Mark, the world's largest jazz and blues record store, and a priceless treasure trove of historic LPs documenting the evolution of America's quintessential native-born native music art forms. In 1996, Bob was inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame, and today it gives us great pleasure to present to him the 2014 Spirit Award for the essential role he has played in keeping music in all its many forms alive. Please join me in recognizing Bob Custer. Well, uh, so, some of that is a little bit overstated. <laughs> Jim, did you actually work in the store? No, no. I got some work out of you, though. That happened. Uh, we'd, we'd let you collate records to get a free copy of the record. We used, that was one of our little rackets. Uh, it has been a great pleasure to be in the record industry. I was originally wanted to be a cinematographer. Two of my younger brothers succeeded in that field. One of them did cops and the other guy did TV shows and pictures. One was in the union, one never quite made it. Uh, it was just a hobby that turned into a business when I'd find Glenn Miller records that I didn't really want and I could sell them and get other records. I have to pay tribute to a guy named Albert, I forget his first name, in Wichita, my hometown, who made a swap deal with a lady who owned what was later Rose's rec Rose Records. Uh, she had a similar name, it escapes me now. He swapped, uh, thought he was swapping blues records, or no, hillbilly records for pop records, but he got an awful lot of blues records. And I got fascinated by stacks of records by people who didn't seem to have last names. Washboard Sam, Big Bill, Memphis Minnie. And that was one of the things that got me interested. And for 29 cents, I could get a Memphis Mini Vocalion is probably worth 10 or $20 now. Uh, I met a, some black jukebox operators. Uh, each of them had a couple of Robert Johnson records, which uh, records are not as rare as their, their price would <laughs> indicate these days. Uh, I know when I sold my collection to record Sleepy John Estes in 62 and had to move the store and new business would turn to zero, or, you know, uh, I sold my collection. I had eight Robert Johnson records. I had three Charlie Patton records. And of course, Paul Guerin got most of those really good ones. Uh, he had worked for me. He quit when, uh, when we moved because he couldn't help do the lifting things because of a back problem. Uh, he supervise the auction of these records with the uh, understanding it could meet the top bid, which he usually added a dollar. So he got some Charlie Pattons for $25 and he got some Roberts for five. Uh, all through my life, I've had people like Jim O'Neill, who never got paid, uh, Paul Guerin, who was on the payroll, Joe Siegel, who taught me all about modern jazz, uh, Chuck Nessa, who, who explained a lot, and Pete Welding, uh, a name you might be familiar with because he had a label, a blues label. Uh, but Pete Welding explained avant-garde jazz. And Don DeMichael, who was a straight-ahead jazz drummer and the editor of Downbeat. There have been all these wonderful people in my life that have helped me record 
Roscoe Mitchell uh, record uh, one thing. Uh, Bruce Sigler had never told me just how good it was Bruce's first. Huh? How, just how good Hound Dog Taylor was. He kept him to himself for several months until he got really on his feet with it. Bruce uh, operated Alligator Records out of our back room at our uh, Lincoln Avenue place. Am I talking too long? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's it's not Bob Kester that's done Delmark and Jazz Record Mark. It's uh, 200 other people who work for me or influence me or give me collated records and got a freebie out of it. Thank you very much. I really feel grateful. <laughs> Our second Spirit Award goes to the Scott family. Yeah. <laughs> Spanning more than five decades, the Scott family represents one of Chicago's most enduring music legacies. Family members have served as backup musicians for a host of Chicago legends and carved out a place for themselves in the pantheon of visionary blues artists. Starting out in the late 50s as the doo-wop vocal ensemble, The Masquerades, the Scott brothers, including Howard, Charles, and Tommy, began laying the groundwork for the family's renown. In the early 60s, another brother, Buddy, joined the group on the guitar. As the popularity of doo-wop faded, the brothers refined their instrumental skills and became one of Chicago's most in-demand session bands. In the 1970s and 80s, several of the brothers left the group to forge reputations on their own or with other bands. Buddy, devoted to the traditional blues, became a well-respected guitarist on the Chicago club circuit. Bass player and singer Howard assembled a new group known as the Scott Brothers World Band, which eventually included his other guitar-playing brother, Walter. The World Band eventually joined fo forces with several younger family members, including nephews Jerome and Kenneth Scott, and served as, as the backup band for the late iconic soul singer Tyrone Davis. Walter's versatile guitar work has graced countless Chicago soul recording sessions through, throughout the years. Now known as Sir Walter Scott, he has worked with, <laughs> he has worked with the Shy Lights, among others, and fronts a re reconstituted world band, which we will have the pleasure of hearing later this evening. Howard still sings occasionally and has become an esteemed mentor to young artists. Buddy, who passed away in 1994, held court for many years at Lee's Unleaded Blues on South Chicago Avenue with his band, The Rib Tips. The prodigious Scots, in all of their various permutations, alone, together, and with others, have had an indelible ripple effect upon the Chicago music scene. Their impact on blues, soul, and R&B has been monumental. It gives us great pleasure, therefore, to honor this robust family with this year's Spirit Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Fink. I'm not used to talking on the mic. Okay. But first of all, I want you to get together and give the Scott family a nice hand. Okay. 
It's been a long journey. Uh, we've taught many, many stars that are out here tonight that you know about. The late Tyrone Davis, the oldest Clay, uh, Harold Barrage. I could go on forever naming these different guys, okay? And they're still coming. These are, this is the young generation. Let's get together and give Hollywood Scott the nice hand. And Juwan Scott, let's give him a nice hand. Tonight you're going to hear young lady Gertha Scott. Let's give her a nice hand, okay? And of course, I wouldn't have done it all by myself. That's your buddy Scott and Walter Scott. Let's give him a nice hand, okay? We want to thank you for the award. We want to take up all your time and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Blue Jay said he's, he's ready to get down tonight. <laughs> okay? But anyway, I want to thank you for the award. And I want to say, uh, I'll see you in the future. How about that? Okay? <laughs>